you guys ready? Yeah. We're here this morning, you know, this evening. You know, in her song, Alana talks about activation. You know, you look on the external plane, and this is called a pre-election rally. But you know, Martin Luther King said we need a quantitative shift in our circumstances and a qualitative shift in our souls. I was so fascinated when I wrote a book called The Healing of America in 1997. Thank you. And I studied American history, and I studied about Mahatma Gandhi, and I studied about Martin Luther King, and I was so fascinated by how their political philosophies were based on their spiritual convictions. And both of them, these two greatest political lights of the 20th century, spoke of the internal changes that must precede external change. And those of us who are involved in personal growth, spirituality, transformation, psychotherapy, recovery, and so forth, we know this. And we're now living at a time in America where that's hardly fringe. If anything, you're a little bit out of it if you don't know that conversation. <laughs> because it's simply a psychological precept, it is a law of human consciousness. That before anything happens out there, first it happened in here. And when something's happening in here, and it is combined with something that is happening in here, then what happens out there really rocks. <laughs> and that's not only in terms of our individual lives. Before there was an abolitionist movement, there was a lot that had to happen inside human beings. Human beings who chose not to just look away. Human beings who chose not to just ignore what was going on. Human beings who got to the point where they could no longer look away, where they could no longer ignore what was going on, when they knew in order to be deeply human beings, they had to take a stand. And that was when things appeared on the outside. If you open a history book and it says, well, when did the abolitionist movement begin? The history book would probably talk about some marker in the external world that was the year in which this or this happened. But what preceded that was like a woman who was pregnant with a child. The internal gestation that occurs before anything or anyone is given birth into the world. And the same with the women suffragettes. At what point did enough women say, enough? And the same thing with the civil rights movement. At what point was the energy so intense and the field so fiery that if it hadn't been Rosa Parks, it would have been someone who simply would not get up? King living up to her creed. Our creed. Our creed. What is our creed? Our creed is that all men are created equal. Our creed is that there shall be equal opportunity in this country. Our creed is that all men shall be equal before the law. Our creed is that there would be equality of rights and equality of opportunity. There would be equality of education. There would be equality of the right to speak one's mind. And no man would be above any other man. And as Martin Luther King said in the Civil Rights March, we're not coming to ask for new rights. We're coming to cash a check. Because the U.S. Constitution and the U.S. Declaration of Independence promise those things. And that would mean, therefore, if all men are created equal, they wouldn't even be just all men. It would be all men and all women. And if all men are created equal, it wouldn't mean just white men. It would also mean black men and black women. And if all men are created equal, that doesn't just mean straight men and 
women and it's gay men and women. And we as Americans should be proud. We should be proud that we are the inheritors of a great legacy. A legacy by which generation after generation there had been people whose hearts were on fire with what that meant. Who realized and remembered and recognized what the world is like when those things do not hold true. People who remember and recognize that before this country was founded and still in some places today, none of that is real for people. There's a king and there's a queen and there's the kings and the queens cronies, the aristocracy. And before the founding of this country, the Western world was dominated by a social system that deemed those people, the royalty and the aristocracy, simply entitled. Entitled to the land, entitled to the gold, entitled to the crops, entitled to the resources. And they lived their lives feasting on the resources of their country. While the vast majority of people of that population had to simply struggle to survive by competing for whatever crumbs fell off the table after the aristocracy and the monarchy had feasted. But it was worse than that. They had no hope that it would ever be different. And if the king said, off with your head, because the king was in a bad mood that day, or the aristocrats decided you couldn't live there any longer because they just didn't feel like they wanted you to. You had no recourse. And so the founding of this country was in repudiation of that kind of a system. The founding of this country was in repudiation. <laughs> okay. <laughs> You're right. The American Indians as well, did I not mention <laughs> that we were founded not only with slavery, we were also founded on the genocide of Native Americans. That is true. <laughs> and with the founding of this country, we today talk about a paradigm shift. What greater paradigm shift can there be than to go from a system in which it is deemed that God gave divine power to the king and that with that power the king could rule over everyone else. To shift philosophically to the idea that God created everyone equal. And so the political shift from a monarchy and an aristocracy to a democracy was preceded by a spiritual shift, a philosophical shift, a moral shift, a shift in how human beings were seen in relation to each other and relation to the universe. And in a situation where someone else has the power because God gave it to them and you don't, and God gave them power over you, what that means is that your wings can only spread so far. Your wings can only spread as far as that person or those people said they could. And that's why freedom matters. Democracy matters because it is a container for the self-actualization of the individual. Democracy and freedom and liberty aren't just so that you can get what you want. Democracy and freedom and liberty mean if everybody has power and any of us are deemed able to be whoever we want to be and to do whatever we want to do as long as it doesn't hurt anyone else, then I can fly and I can soar as high as I choose and as high as my hard work takes me. about politics as we think of politics here. We are talking about the evolution of the human race here. We are talking about the evolutionary arc from a human being who has to crouch underneath the constrictions of some external force to a time where human beings can stand in the light of day and sing if they want to sing and paint if they want to paint and love who they want to love and do what they want to do so that the glory of God can shine through them and ultimately in collaboration with other people who are self-actualized.
actualizing in their own lives ultimately actualize a planet at peace, a planet in joy, the planet that is an automatic reflection of people becoming who we are capable of being. of this country, the amazing narrative of this country, is not that we never got it wrong. We had slavery. There was the genocide of the Native Americans. Women had no rights. Women had no vote. There was institutionalized racism well into the 20th century. Jim Crow laws legalized segregation in the American South. But that is just the beginning of the story. You know, in all the great religious systems, in all the great spiritual traditions, there's really only one story. There was the suffering, and then there was the deliverance from the suffering. Whether it was Jesus on the cross, or Jesus resurrected, or the Jews in, in, in Egypt in slavery delivered to the promised land, or Buddha talking about the Maya of the world and the human suffering that it produces, and the enlightenment which brings one to happiness. Those religious principles are simply a description of the laws of consciousness and the laws of the universe. And so we as human beings suffer, but we as souls aspire to be happy. And even though sometimes whole groups of people suffer together in slavery, oppressed, at the effect of injustice, even though whole groups sometimes suffer together, what political progress is, is when whole groups of people aspire to happiness together. When whole groups of people aspire for the light beyond the darkness. When whole groups of people aspire for the justice to replace injustice. When whole groups of people aspire for the goodness that lies be behind and beyond that which is sometimes the cruelty and the coldness of the human heart. That is the story of every human life. And that is the story of every nation. That is the story of every culture. That is the story of ethnicity. That is the story of every religion. And that is the story of the world. Now, as Americans, we are stewards. That's what every generation is. We are stewards of this profound ideal. And that's what America is. All that anything is on the outside is a reflection of something on the inside. America is an idea. America is an idea that there would be a place on this earth where people could be who they wanted to be. It was radical. It was radical 200 years ago. And it is radical today. And our founders told us, this is not a guarantee. You must be vigilant. And so what we see throughout history is that in every generation there are those whose hearts are on fire with what this means and the sacred responsibility, not just the rights of democracy, but the responsibility of every generation to say, this is ours to protect and this is ours to foster and this is ours to expand so that we can then bequeath it to our children. And in other generations, like that of the abolitionists and like that of the suffragettes and like that, the generation that fought World War II, like those of the civil rights movement, generations before us have stood up when that ideal was threatened, have stood up when that ideal was not embodied, have stood up when that ideal was not made manifest, and they struggled, and they stood, and they sacrificed whatever needed to happen in order to make sure that America in their time would live up to its creed. Ladies and gentlemen, it's time for us to do that. Let's because you'll need it for the next two weeks. <laughs> our generation, I believe, is prepared. Our generation, as Alana said, our consciousness is prepared. You know, America, 
Every 40 or 50 years, a generation of Americans wakes up and goes, what the hell's going on? <laughs> Winston Churchill said you can always count on Americans to do the right thing after they have exhausted every other option. <laughs> People all over the world waffle their eyes about Americans. They think that we're disconnected and that we're self-centered and that we're disengaged and that we're not looking at really important things that are happening right in front of us, sometimes around the world and sometimes in our own backyard. But in my experience, the same people around the world who roll their eyes about us would be the first to acknowledge when we do wake up, we slam it like nobody's doing. After, after Pearl Harbor, a Japanese admiral famously said, I fear we have awakened a sleeping giant. He was right. And a sleeping giant is waking up now. And let me tell you why that sleeping giant is waking up. Because when push comes to shove, even though we take all this freedom stuff for granted sometimes, even though we get distracted, even though we live under the assault of modernity, even though sometimes meaningless occupations and preoccupations just take up so much of our attention that we forget those things that are really true. Deep down, we do care. And what I've seen in my life, in my work, over this wonderful career that this town has given me is that sometimes it's when people are down, when people have been told you have cancer, when people have been told your child is an addict, when people have been told it's over for you, you have nothing left. Sometimes I have seen it. I have seen it more often than not that when people realize that the worst that could happen has happened, that's when sometimes we become most beautiful. That's at times when we become most noble. That at times is we become most intelligent. And that I think is what it means when they say often in Alcoholics Anonymous that every problem comes bearing its own solution. Because when you're really in a problem, you are more likely to be delivered to the consciousness which if you had been there to begin with, would not have allowed the problem to develop and which now that you are there becomes an automatic transformer of the situation so that that which was a problem becomes an opportunity. <clears throat> And that's why those of us who are seeking to live conscious lives know that we can't be in denial about our problems. We can't refuse to look at our defects. We can't refuse to look at our own shadows because we know that everything is having a consequence. So it's important to be conscious about what's happening because everything that's happening will bear fruit whether we're looking at it or not. So look at it, because if it's good, it's going to be wonderful, but if it's not good, change it now. And all that a country is, is a collection of individuals. So the same inquiry that an individual must go through in order to be conscious, in order to be mature, in order to be truly human beings, in order to live the most well-lived life, human beings need a personal internal inquiry. We can't just fix things on the outside when we're in trouble. We have to ask, who am I really? Am I living the principles I say I believe in? By the way, what are the principles that I believe in? And in the places where I am not living the principles that I believe in, where do I need to change? Where do I need to course correct? And the universe, being so merciful, allows us to, so that when we have deviated from the best, when we have deviated from the better angels of our nature, and we do course correct, and we do change, wonderful things happen, breakthroughs happen, miracles happen. Ladies and gentlemen, the United States of America has a deep inquiry it needs to undergo right now. The United States of America needs to take a deep look at itself. The United States of America has to look, are we a democracy, really? Because Princeton University just put out a paper saying we're actually not. We are functioning not as a democracy, but as an oligarchy. Lincoln said we were a government of the people, by the people, and for the people. But are we really? Because the last time I looked, we've become a government of a few of the people, by a few of the people, and for a few of the people. Why are so many black men in jail? Yeah. 
If that's the case, why is it that there are so clearly people in this country who are not experiencing the fruits of what a democratic society should be like? But like I said before, this is not the first time America has not been living up to its creed. Let's just make sure that it's not the first time that a generation fails to stand up to the challenge of course correcting what needs to be done. easy to see what was wrong. They were like operable tumors that could be surgically removed. Slavery, lack of women's suffrage, legal segregation. You could see what the problem was, and so you knew what you had to do to fix it. Today, the problem is more like a cancer that has metastasized. It's sort of everywhere. It's sort of the financialization of everything. It's a multinational corporate takeover of the United States of America. It's the fact it's the fact that multi, that money forces wield the power over the functioning of our government that is so totally disproportionate to the power that is wielded by the average citizen as to represent the dismantling of the foundations of democracy itself. Ladies and gentlemen, you don't mock the Gettysburg Address and not discuss it. And yet that's what's happening. What's happening today is over the last few decades, we have, through banking policies and trade policies and tax policies, siphoned so much of the material wealth of this country into the hands of a very few people as to be a dangerous trajectory and a genuine de-democratization of the United States of America. This is not something to not notice. This is not something to look away from. This is not something to think, oh, that has nothing to do with me. It has everything to do with all of us if we take very seriously our responsibility as citizens. Our responsibility as is that every generation has to be a steward of this precious thing called democracy. When I said before, when I said before that suffering is what matters, human suffering is what matters, it's not statistics that matter. It's not just dry numbers, it's not just dry facts that matter. What matters is human suffering. So when we hear a statistic like 1% controlling 43% of the wealth, or 60% of the people living on 2.3% of the wealth, it's not just the numbers. It's not just the statistics. It's the unnecessary human suffering that results from this. It's the fact. It's the fact. That among all advanced nations of the world, we're the second highest child poverty rate. Second only to Romania. That one in five American children live in poverty. That one in five American children are deemed food insecure. Many of these obese children are actually malnourished. It's the fact that we have the highest mass incarceration rate in the world. 2.4 million people in prison in the United States. 500,000 non-violent drug offenders. Many mentally ill people for whom there were no other resources, so really there was nothing we, this nation could come up to do with them except throw them in jail. And the fact that an African-American man has a one in three lifetime probability of incarceration. These things, to the conscious heart, are morally unacceptable. realities, the political institutions that we were brought up to think would handle these things. You know, we'd see terrible things and go, well, you know, somebody will fix it, you know, one of those agencies or something. Somebody will fix it, you know, somebody in Congress or the President or, you know, we have a constitution, the Supreme Court will fix it. <laughs> Today we never know whose side they're on. These days we never know when our own government might be chopping the wood and carrying the water for the very forces we were brought up to believe it would protect us from should those forces overreach. And so what happens now is that we cannot look to the political status quo to fix the problem because they are the problem. We cannot look to the political status quo to fix that which is the disease when that political status quo is the disease. And this is not about individuals. There are lovely people in Washington. There are good people in Washington. And there are lovely people in this race, by the way. 
I have a lot of respect now for anybody who runs for political office. <laughs> this is not about demonizing individuals at all. This is about recognizing that the system itself is rotting from the inside. We have a cancer that is eating our democracy. We have become a legalized system of bribery and corruption. must deal with this. Not looking to a political establishment to deal with this, who through trade policies, tax policies, and banking policies made things the way they are. The status quo never gives birth to the next great era of change. By definition, the status quo is happy with the way things are. Our political establishment is so beholden to the problem. The money forces that just pour in to election cycle after election cycle. And when your political institutions need that money in order to get elected and to stay elected, you know what it's time for? It's time for the people to step in. That is what abolition was. No major political party said, oh, let's free the slaves. The people said, let's free the slaves. A major political party came afterwards. It wasn't a major political party who said, let's give women the right to vote. The women themselves, the people themselves, it was a people's movement. So it was the abolitionist party, it was a suffragette party. It was a people's movement, both of them. And then major political parties came later. And the same with the civil rights movement. It was a people's movement. Dr. King, Southern Christian Leadership Conference, it was a people's movement, and major party came later. It is time now, in our day, in our generation, for a people's movement. And Country. 
I think there's something really marvelous that's happening. And I feel so honored and so privileged that in this campaign, I have felt heard because I feel that I have spoken into a listening that was already there. I feel at this point, I feel at this point in my career, I don't feel any different than I felt throughout my career. And that is, I'm not saying anything everybody I know isn't saying, I'm just saying it into the microphone. Because everybody's saying it, everybody is thinking it, everybody's going, doesn't it seem to you it's just all about money now? Yeah. Duh. That's why we are not adequately dealing with the global climate change crisis. We know it's a crisis. The American people know it's a crisis. And we would like to adequately address it for the sake of our children, our grandchildren, and our planet. But the oil companies actually, through their money, wage more power over the decision making of the US government than we do. That's a problem. The American people, certainly those of us in California, understand about the threats to our food supply, GMOs, herbicides, pesticides. It's not that we don't know, not that we don't care. There's a problem, though. The chemical companies and the big biotech agricultural companies, because of the money they can pour into the system, are able to have more influence over the functioning of our government than we are. That's a problem. like to think they too could have health insurance, but we don't have universal health insurance like all other Western democracies. Why? Well, because the health insurance companies and pharmaceutical companies so clearly just dictate what they will allow. That's a problem. And we have shrinking civil liberties. The government itself, through the National Defense Authorization Act, has given itself the legal authority to indefinitely detain U.S. citizens. That's a problem. The NSA is spying on your cell phones. I heard some young person said the other day, well, what's the big deal? Facebook knows all about me. I'll tell you the problem. Facebook can't prosecute you. That's a problem. And the drones are coming, so let's not kid ourselves. The technological capacity of a drone is to know who you are sleeping with, what your login details are, and who just walked into the room. That could be a problem. And so, you have to name the disease in order to know what medicine to take. You have to name the problem in order to claim the solution. Bill Clinton actually said once, and I, I never forgot, I thought it was a great line. There's nothing wrong with America that can't be made right by what's right with America. So we have talked tonight about the problem, and you know what the solution is? The American people when they're woke up. The American people when they say, oh, no, 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 no I'm not going to be doing that. The American people when they say, you know, this democracy thing really does matter to us. The American people when they say, you know, this all men are created equal thing, we'd like to keep it, please. The American people when they stand up and say, just as the blood circulates in the body and it has to circulate throughout the body in order to the body, for the body to be healthy. I read a book called Gardens of Democracy and it said, just like the blood has to circulate around the body for the body to be healthy, opportunity has to circulate around a society in order for a society to be healthy. We celebrate. We celebrate that people can make it in America. It's a beautiful thing that people can make it in America. We just want to guarantee that to the best of our ability, we've created a society where anybody who works hard enough can make it in America. That's what we want. We want capitalism. We want the high side of capitalism. The fair exchange where I create something of value, you give me a dollar for that, you walk away with the product, I walk away with the dollar, that's a win-win. That is in alignment with the laws of the universe. Everybody wins. But that's different than a predatory form, a predatory strain of capitalism on some multinational level in which there is no reverence for the earth, there is no reverence for people, there is no reverence for anything that is given primacy before the dollar in terms of short-term economic gain for some force or some entity which is so powerful that the average person simply cannot fight it. That is unfair, it is unjust, it is immoral, it is unethical, it is un-American, and I believe with all my heart, it is unsustainable.
point, well, what are you going to do about it? You know, slavery's been here forever, there's nothing we can do. But abolitionists did not let that stop them. And I'm sure that there were women who thought, oh, we haven't had the right to vote, we're not going to get the right to vote, you know, there's nothing we can do. But the, the women suffragettes were women who did not let that stop them. And I'm sure there were people in the American South who looked at segregation and lived under those laws and just said, there's nothing we can do. Life is not moved forward by people who say, there's nothing we can do. Life is not moved forward by people who just look away. Life is not look for, moved forward by people who whine, by people who just moan and complain. Life is not moved forward by people who are cynical. Life is moved forward by people who stand on what they believe to be true, who stand on what they know, who stand on the idea that if one thing is morally unacceptable, I shall take my stand in this place, and I shall invoke through the grace of God that other possibility as yet unseen, but eminently feasible when the awakened heart takes its stand. other generation after all. This democracy was not guaranteed to us. Our founders told us that we must be vigilant. And now we are learning, that's all. We are learning just like we do in our own individual lives. Sometimes you have a relationship, you didn't tend to it, and you lose it. Sometimes you have an opportunity in life, and you didn't really take a stand within that and fulfill the possibilities of that opportunity, and the opportunity went away. Sometimes in life, a window opens, and it's only later that you realize, wow, that was it, I should have, I should have just strolled in right then. But then the next time a window like that opens, you go, I'm not going to do that again. This time, I'm going to show up for life. And those of us who know that, those of us who have been through that, those of us who feel I had opportunities and they went away because I, 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 I didn't take care of them. I had relationships and they went away because I didn't take care of them. I had a window of opportunity and it closed because I didn't stroll in. Let us realize what a big drama this is. What a big time on the planet this is. What a big thing it is to be a citizen of the United States. What a big thing it is to be one of only 20% of the people of this world who have the kind of direct influence on the functioning of our government that we have. What a big thing it is to be a citizen in the most powerful nation in the world. A nation who, when we get it right, are a blessing on this planet, and when we get it wrong, cause tragedy for ourselves and others. This is not somebody else's responsibility responsibility, it's our responsibility. If every citizen is equal in rights, then I believe every citizen is equal in responsibility. If we don't like, if we don't like, if we don't like the fact that politics has become such a shallow container, then let's create a deep container. If we don't like the fact that politics is only about the neck up, then let's put some soul into it. If we don't like the fact that politics is just a place where I'm a Republican, you're a Democrat, or I'm a Democrat, or you're a Republican, let's just get beyond that conversation. Let's realize that the real issues in America today aren't left right anyway. I don't care if you're a conservative or a liberal. If you're really looking at what it means that our civil liberties are shrinking, that freaks you out. I don't care if you're a liberal or a conservative. If you really take a deep look at what it means to see all this expanding domestic surveillance, it is disturbing to you. And so let's be up beyond the canards. Let's get beyond the illusions. Let's do the work that needs to be done. Each and every one of us is called. We are called in our own lives. Some of us are called to be artists. Some of us are called to be business people. Some of us are called to technology. And there's some things we're all called to. We're all called to love. We're all called to relationships. And I believe President Dwight Eisenhower was correct when he said politics should be the part-time profession of every American. When it comes to politics, when seen consciously and lived consciously, we are all called. The French say, if you don't do politics, politics will do you. And so, ladies and gentlemen, I think it is time for something new in America. And I understand that the political establishment does do, will do, has done, and will really do in the next two weeks. All the minimization, all the trivialization, we know how that works. First they ignore you, then they laugh at you, then they fight you, and then, ha <laughs> ha, you win. <laughs>
the joy with which so many people around this district and around this country have joined in. I have felt heard. I have felt supported. And more than that, I feel the people, the issue of support is interesting. I don't want people to just show up to support this campaign. I want people to feel like this campaign is supporting you as much as you are being drawn to support this campaign. We are not supporting. We are collaborating. We are collaborating in the creation of a new field of energy. that we were Americans and that the Constitution gives everybody equal rights and that everybody's supposed to be in to be in politics and everybody's supposed to have an equal education and everybody's supposed to have good opportunity and access to the economy of the United States. Before we went, oh, okay, well, we just won't do that. But we're not okay with what's happening now. The founders of this country intended the House of Representatives to be the people's house. They called it the people's house. They said that the farmer would be there for a while. They thought the shopkeeper would be there for a while. They thought the candle maker should be there for a while. And you know what? That's what it should be now. The yoga teacher should be there for a while. The activist should be there for a while. The student should be there for a while. The stay-at-home parent should be there for a while. It should be the people's house. But what's happening today is the average American is locked out. 
The average American is locked out from the capacity to have genuine political influence. It costs too much. And the average Amer American every day is getting more and more locked out of access to real education. When you see the college graduates of the United States coming out with an average of $30,000 in student loan debt, student loan debt, which now exceeds credit card debt. So now you're saying even only those who can afford it can get a decent education. You know what I say? I say if these young people have paid paid good faith on your student loan for 10 years, it is forgiven now. And for those of you going now, for those of you going now, you give your country, you give your country one year of public service, one year of national service. Military could be just one of many things you could do, and baby, you just paid for four years of college education. Why not? Why not? Why should hundreds of thousands of American children start kindergarten because they didn't go to preschool? They, they're behind on day one of kindergarten, and then if we don't catch them up with their reading by second grade or on a 50% probability track to incarceration. I'm not saying preschool should be mandatory. I do not believe it should be, but it should be universally accessible. There are just so many things I'd love to do in Washington. So many things I'd love to vote against. I'd so love to vote against the National Defense Authorization Act. I'd so love to vote against the Military Authorization Act by which Congress has basically abdicated its responsibility to wage war and said to the president, whoever that president is, go wherever you want to go, do whatever you want to do, kill whoever you want to do, as long as it's in the vague rubric of a war on terrorism. I'd love to vote against that one. of peace building. I'd like to vote for that bill that creates a cabinet level position in the executive branch of the U.S. government whose sole responsibility is to research, articulate, and facilitate non-violent problem-solving options for both domestic and international policy. statement of glass steagle so that the banks are continuing to have the kind of permission they have. I would love to vote for a bill that says we really should prosecute all those white collar criminals who cause this kind of And so you know who I am. I'm not new around here. You know what I stand for? You've seen Project Angel Food. You know that I helped start the Department of Peace campaign. You know that I'm on the board of results that does what I, it can to end the worst ravages of hunger and poverty around the world. You know who I am. You know what I stand for. I have for the last seven months gone around this district. I've met so many people. I've been so received. I have felt so loved. I have felt so supported. I felt so collaborated with. And what I know is that this campaign is speaking into something. This campaign is speaking into the zeitgeist. And I know that the zeitgeist is not only here, it is around this country. And I know this. I know, and I know this from my own life experience and career. You start a conversation in LA, it is a national trend within five years. on June 3rd, and then later, in November, an independent to Congress. Yeah. I've been a Democrat all my life. I've been a Democrat all my life. My heart is with what I always was believing that the Democratic Party is, and I still believe can be. But my, my allegiance is to my country, not to a political party. Yeah. I will caucus with the Democrats if you send me to Congress, but I like the way Bernie Sanders can be an independent yeah. senator. I'm this or that. I don't want to. When Einstein said we need a new kind of thinking, that the problems of the world will not be solved by the same level of thinking we were at when we created them, that begs the question, what is that new level of thinking? It is not a place where we start off thinking that you're one thing and I'm another. Ladies and gentlemen, we need to move beyond that. We need to be together, to talk together, to work together as Americans. And that's what I've done in this campaign. I haven't been talking to rich people.
people, poor people, black people, white people, Jewish people, Latino people, Christian people, it's not like that. This campaign has been about talking to Americans. And that's what's so beautiful, because I believe the American in us answers. So over the next two weeks, I would be so honored if you would collaborate with me. In the lobby tonight, there are so many ways and so many things that you can see. Ways that you, ways that you can be involved. Ways that you can do what you feel in your heart. Share with me this intention. An intention that on June 3rd, this campaign is lifted to its highest level of creative possibility. Share with me this intention, that this campaign itself is, can be, and shall be a collective act of love. Join with me in intention that this campaign stands for the greatest possibility for all of us who are involved and all of us who have come to be part of and to participate in this magnificent experiment called America. So join with me in intention that this is not a shallow pursuit, this is a deep pursuit. Join with me in intention that this is one of the most important things that we have ever been called to, that citizenship is part of our consciousness, that citizenship is part of a calling to all that is good and all that is true and all that is beautiful. Join with me in intention. Join with me in the thinking that produces that intention. Join with me in the desire that it be so. Join with me in the work to make it happen. Join with me then in the celebration that the win on June 3rd, regardless of what that win is in terms of electoral votes, shall be a win nonetheless. Because here in this place, with this campaign, all of us together have joined forces, have joined our minds, have joined our hearts, have joined our efforts in doing something with to, which to the best of our ability is a gift, is a gift not only to our children, but it's a gift to our country that we're not afraid to say that, that we don't think it's cheesy to say that, that there's something really beautiful about saying that. This life is not just about me, and it's not just about you, it is about us. And it's not just about our time on Earth, it's about other times on Earth. It's about those who went before, and it's about those who will come after. It's about us becoming the men that we are capable of being and the women that we are capable of being. It's about our spreading our wingspan as high and as far and as wide as they can go. That we might be able to say, I am a man or I am a woman who feels that I am living my destiny. And I'm taking responsibility for the destiny of my tribe, the destiny of my country, the destiny of the human race. And in my own way, that each of us can feel we showed up. We showed up in our time, we showed up for life, we showed up for our generation, we showed up for our time, and yes, we showed up for our country. God bless you, everybody. Thank you. So let's, with hearts on fire, step up our game and change this game. If anybody, if anybody is not registered tonight, you can register in the lobby. We have volunteers who will even tell you where your polling place is. And if you have your absentee ballot, go home and fill it out today. Wear a shirt. I've been wearing this shirt since October. <laughs> not just this one. I have a few. You're cute shirts too, and aren't they? I mean, it's just in conversation with every single person you run into in District 33 and have a conversation and tell them why you support Marianne. And I That's how we're going to get this done. And I have uh, a history of uh, being afraid to ask for money. So I'm going to face that fear right now. Yes. Say that I couldn't uh, ask uh, for a dollar when I was in high school. And I am honored tonight to ask you to please reach into your pockets and give anything that you can to help get Marianne into Congress. Yes. Quarters and yes. volunteer your time. Mm -hmm. 
volunteer. Be a part of the boots on the ground. Boots on the ground. ground. Boots yes, on the grassroots. ground. And also get bumper stickers. And there are these cool little things that like like car magnets. The car magnets. I have a car magnet on my car. Car signs. Don't Brett, mess up your your car. You I don't like stickers right on. on my get car. Stickers. Get t-shirts. <laughs> what? And you know. When the big day comes, don't let it pass you by. No. Don't go, I should have heard everybody. I was busy, oh my God. No. Just put it the first thing on your list. Yes, the torch has been passed yes. to a new generation, to quote somebody else who was quite fabulous, John F. Kennedy. It is our time, it is our time to step up and change the paradigm, and let's start by getting this woman in Congress. Woo!